right, everybody. Open your Bibles, if you please, to Exodus 12, 25 to start. We're just going to kick things off in Exodus, but Exodus 12, 25. 12, 25. The title of the message today is The Grapes of Wine, but wine is spelled W-H-I-N-E. I, it's a pun palooza today. I, it wasn't intended, by the way, for this, but uh, it's The Grapes of Wine, and uh, so I have a little joke, actually, to kick things off for you. What does a grape say when it gets stepped on? Yes, it doesn't say anything. It just lets out a little wine. Boy, it's going to go downhill from here. So just hang in there with me. <laughs> Exodus 12, 25. Now, this is what God says. Of course, this is his book. This is his word. Understand, this isn't man's ideals or what he thinks men should, other men should know. But this is God's word. He is forever settled in heaven. It is the authority on our lives. When God makes a promise, God keeps his promise. Amen? Amen. Aren't you glad you serve that God today? Yes. I tell you, I certainly am. So in Exodus 12, 25, God's word says this, And it shall come to pass, when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the service today. I thank you for the special. Lord, I thank you for the hymns. Lord, I thank you for the time of prayer. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your, your son, Jesus Christ, who you came to save sinners. Lord, oh, how you love us. I pray if no one's ever been saved here today, Lord, if there's one that doesn't know, I pray that you touch their heart, Lord, that their eternal destination would now become heaven instead of hell. Heavenly Father, this is an urgent matter. And being in church, it's an urgent matter to give the truth. Help us, Lord, to be receiving, open to receiving your truth, Lord, your word, and that we would not be confused by the words of man. Empty me of myself today, Lord. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let me be a mouthpiece for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So I'll read that again. Exodus 12, 25. It says, And it shall come to pass when ye uh, be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, then ye shall keep this service. But what I really want you to focus on in that verse as we go into the sermon is the fact that the Lord will give you according as he hath promised. Promised. Now, have you ever made a promise before? Yes, I'll, I'll answer for you. Yes, of course you have. But we all have. Have you ever had someone promise you something? Of course you have. Now, you like to think that when someone makes you a promise or you promise somebody, it's as ironclad as when God makes that promise, but man does not always come through on promises. And it's not always intentional. Sometimes things happen. Hey, I'll be at your house next week, but you don't, you don't anticipate your car breaking down. You can't make it. Or something else that would happen to uh, take place. You promised, but you promised something that was outside of your control. Only God really could make a true blue promise and keep it a thousand percent of the time. We must understand this. But God gave to the Israelites a promised land. When they were in bondage in Egypt, that land was already theirs from the foundation of the world. God had a plan that the Israelites would wind up in, the, in Canaan land, that that would be their land. He settled. It was always his plan. It was always going to happen. God guaranteed it. How much more relaxed do you live in your life, in your faith, knowing when God has guaranteed something to you? If you're saved, he's guaranteed you eternal life. Does that give you some relief? Does that give you some joy? It's meant to, according to the scriptures. And that should encourage you that God has created uh, a place for you. Jesus said, behold, I go and prepare a place for you. If it were not true, I would have told you. He goes and he doesn't just prepare as a little shack, even though that'd be fine. I'd take a cardboard box in heaven. But I, the fact that he's going to make us a mansion says a lot about how much our God loves us. He's, he's willing to come and take on the form of a man and die a terrible death on the cross for us, shed his blood for us. Then he's going to go to heaven and prepare a place for us. He's going to give us streets of gold. He's going to wipe every tear away. He's going to give us crowns for those who are going to earn them. He's going to give us rewards for those who are going to earn them. And he's, we're going to be at his feet learning from him, from the master for all eternity. I can't wait to get there. These are all promised things to us. And when, I, when something is promised to me, and I know I can believe it, I can get excited about it. Because it's as good as, I'm as good as on those streets of gold today. Because of what God has done, not because of anything I've done. I want you to understand that. Same for you today if you're saved. But we'll get into the meat and potatoes of the message here. Numbers 13 is where we're going to be. Numbers 13. Numbers 13. Number 
verse 13. We'll start in verse, uh, verse 17. It says, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they may dwell in, or that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eshcol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the Brook of Eshcol, because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron, and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the wilderness of Koran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them, and, to, uh, and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great, and moreover we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Uh, they went, the twelve spies... The Lord gave, if you read the beginning of chapter 13, God gave command to Moses to send spies into the land to search the very things that they just went out to search. They were just being obedient to what God had said. Now, I'll throw this one in here for free because I don't think God was concerned with who was in that land. He knew, and he had already promised them the land. But I believe he allowed those spies to go in and check out the land and scout it out as a judgment against the people of Israel. Because of the 12 people, that went in there, you'll find that ten of them gave an evil report. Two of them gave a good one. That's not a good percentage, by the way. Only two of them come in with a good report. Caleb being one of them, Joshua is, of course, the other. Now, the reason for the title today, The Grapes of Wine, like your whining wine, is because negativity spreads very quickly and very easily, and it'll kill a spirit. It'll kill the spirit of a people. It'll kill the spirit of a church. It'll kill the spirit in your household. It'll kill the spirit of a country. If people, that all they want to do is dwell on the negative and find all the things that are wrong. In the earlier parts of the verses that I read to you, they were giving an honest report. Moses told them, Get, bring the fruit. Tell us if, what kind of people are there. Are they in strongholds? Are they in tents? Let us know what it is. And of the twelve, ten of them come back. And they take the report and make it out to where it's too much for us. Can I tell you they were absolutely right? Just like the problems and the giants that are in your life are absolutely too much for you, but they are not too much for God. Amen. God is there to fight your battles. God is there and mightier than anything you'll ever face in this world. And when you put your faith and trust in God to see you through your problems, you will find that you can, uh, you can get through an awful lot because God's carrying you, because God's leading you, God's fighting for you. 
But when you put things in your own hands, that's where you're going to have your problems. And the problem is, once you have a problem and you're not in a good place and you're not positive on what God says, and you don't take him at his promise because didn't we just read in Exodus where he promised them the land? They were at the doorstep of the promised land. All they, they had made their way up finally. It's time to go in. Let's go send some guys in. Let's check the place out. God said to go send these spies in. Let's figure out what we're up against, and then we're just we're going to go in, and God's just going to roll out the red carpet because that's exactly what it is when they follow God and do things His way. They were this close, and they decided to get all scared and negative, and then it washed throughout the entire camp. Caleb said in verse 30, he said, uh, the people before, still the people before Moses, and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Caleb's 100% right, because God is with them. They're, they're, they're trying to obey God, and when they obeyed God, God gave them easy victories. I mean, they weren't even hard. And I think it translates to you and me here today. God will give you the victory if you'll put your faith and trust in God, if you'll let him go before you. I'm okay with hiding behind God. Because I can't win battles on my own. I'm okay with it. He's there for me. He loves me. He saved me. And if you're saved today, he did the same for you. And every one of you in here, I would wager to say, has a battle or two that you're trying to face that at times seems like it's bigger than Goliath could have ever dreamed to have been. Ever. I grew up as a kid. My, my dad was really into the old Godzilla movies. Uh, the, and it seemed like the more they made, the cheesier they got. Nowadays, when they make them, the thing is bigger than, like, half the planet. I don't know, like, one footstep, he takes out half a continent. It's, it's so unrealistic. Well, the whole thing's unrealistic, because there's no such thing as radioactive monsters that we know of. But uh, our God is, is, is bigger than anything that we would ever face. But you know what? Where we run into trouble as individuals, as families, as churches, as anything, any group of people, is when we take our eyes off of the might of God, the goodness of God, the strength of God, and we start reasoning in ourselves what we can do. Now we're going to mess up. And that's what these people, the Israelites, are about to do. See, being so close to the promised land, they, they brought, let me tell you something, grapes that were so big they had to put on staves and have two men carry them out. Now for those of you who know me, I'm not a fruit expert. But I know that it doesn't, I've seen grapes, I've seen the vines, I, I would not ever think that what I see growing up there in Geneva would take two men on stage to grab them out. They're normal sized grapes. Man, I'm imagining these things would be like the size of, I don't know, bowling balls for all I know. Who knows how big they were? But it took two of these grown, strong men with staves to bring just a cluster of them out. There were pomegranates there. There were figs there. And by the way, they confessed that it was indeed a land overflowing with milk and honey. What does that tell you? That there's some milk and honey? There's an abundance of milk and honey. By the way, they were just eating manna at this point. Which, can you imagine if you're out on a trip and God's just feeding you from heaven, from above? That's pretty neat. But they whined about it a few chapters before. He gives them quail, and oh boy, does he give them quail. But nevertheless, all these things, they're going to get good food at the hand of the, the blessed hand of God. A promised land, a place where they'll be safe, a place of their inheritance, a place they have the right to, by God's word, they're right there. And they decide to just backpedal it and just fall apart. Makes me think of fishing. I, I, I remember a time when I was a kid, I loved to get in a fishing boat with my grandma and grandpa. We'd go down to Lake Milton. My grandpa always seemed to know whenever those crappie were biting. And we'd go under Route 76. There's an overpass bridge that goes over that lake with these A-frame beams. And he'd, he'd always pack a bunch of uh, bungee cords. He had a system with, he, he had in his uh, fishing boat. We'd go right underneath that bridge and we'd hook that uh, boat right up to the A-frame. And you'd have these little uh, places of water where you just drop your pole. You just hooked up a live, uh, live bait. We had minnows. And I'm telling you, just as soon as that hook hit the water, boom, that bobber would go under. And my grandpa would just, he'd just throw the lid open on the cooler and said, load it up. He'd let you keep anything, you know. And he said, come on, let's get him. And we would be going there fishing. But my grandma was always one that he, she'd always get tangled up. <laughs> and, you know, anytime you do anything with a family in a tight quarter, it's always interesting, to say the least. So, and of course, my grandpa was at the bow of the boat. My grandma was sitting at the stern, and I was sitting in the middle. And uh, I make it sound like this is a like ocean liner. It was just a little fishing boat. But uh, I'm sitting in the middle, so they're trying to fight around me while I'm fishing, getting this tangled up pole. And my grandma has insisted on using an open face reel, so the bale is open, and, the, and it just looks like a bird's nest popping out of there. And it was always five minutes into it. My grandpa finally got everybody set up. He catches his first fish, and he looks over. And my, my, uh, my grandma always called him Dad, and she said, Dad, 
And she turned around and looked at him, and he's like, oh, gee. And, and he's, he just put his pole away, and he went over there and started working on it. It took him a long time. It just went haywire. And it made a miserable time for really both of them. I was fine. My, my pole had a push button, and I was pulling them out as often as I could drop my line in. But the point of it is, in our faith, and as even whether, whether it's in the church, whether it's in your own personal life, when uh, we let a problem compound and it gets worse, it's like that fishing line comes out of there and all of a sudden it ruins a great part of your time. <laughs> trying to figure out how to get this tangle out that usually we bring on ourselves because we don't put our faith and trust in God. So it goes haywire. And this is what happens to a whole people. They saw the Ten Commandments. They saw God's hand. They saw him part the waters. He, they saw the pillar of cloud. They saw the pillar of fire. They saw the, what is probably the mightiest army on the face of the earth in that day, vanquished by God by just covering them up, up in water. What a miracle. They saw bread coming down from heaven to feed them. All these miracles they firsthand saw, and they didn't believe that he could take out some giants. Think about all the good things God has done in your life, and so much you've overcome because of God in your life. Is there anything that he can't handle for you? So don't get negative. And, and here's where I'll tell you, and we'll, get, we'll progress to this here in a little bit, but be careful who you spend your time with. Because if you spend your time around negative people, you become negative. But if you spend your time around people who are on fire for God, and they're, on, they're positive, and they're in the Word, and they're praying, and they're praying for you, and all they want to talk about is the goodness of God, I highly recommend that you yoke up with that individual. That's how iron sharpens iron. You don't have to wait for an outing. Hey, Amen. You don't have to wait for all the Kingsmen Bible study. You don't have to wait for a golf outing or anything else like that. You can do it Tuesday afternoons. I don't care. Call someone up and be a blessing to them. Say, hey, how you doing? Can I pray for you today? What's on your heart? What's on your mind? Hey, reach out to me. My goodness, I'm your pastor. I love you. I watch for your souls. I care about you. You want to talk? You need something? Man, ask me. Come on. Let's talk scripture. You'll see me go berserk. There'll be uh, smoke rolling off my thumbs if we're texting because I can't get enough of it. I love Christ. I love what he's done for me. I love what he can do for you if you just put your faith and trust in him. He has to be more than just a, a hobby or something you do on a Sunday to go and sit and look pretty for other people. It must be your life. Christ is life. And he must be yours. He's the source of it all. You do that, you're going to be, you'll run through a spiritual brick wall for Christ. You, you, no one can stop you from handing out a track. No one can stop you from praising the Lord in public because you don't give a hoot what anybody says because you're serving your master. You're serving the one who bled and died for you. But you get around the person who's negative. I, I went door knocking once and a dog barked at me. I'll never do that again. I have people in my family I go visit them and the dog barks at me. I still go visit my family. <laughs> Hesitantly. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, hey we, for real. Uh, you know, and that's just one example. People, I, I, you want to talk about pandemics? You want to talk about things that are contagious? You want to talk about things that will wipe out a lot of people in a very short amount of time? It's negativity. It's whining. It's complaining. It's belly aching when God has already made a way. We see what else happens here. Look at chapter 14 right there in verse 1. We'll just keep continuing. This is the rebellion of Israel. It says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation and said unto them, Would God that we have died in the land of Egypt. Give me a break, Israelites. Well, really? Oh, if we could have just died in Egypt. You, he brought you there. You're there. You're right at the, we sit at the doorstep of Canaan. Oh, we've just been beaten to death in, Israel, in, in uh, Egypt. Yeah, you're right, guys. Yeah, it's so much better there. What do they do? First of all, they turn on the leaders that were appointed of God. They start pointing fingers and blaming them. And they did this often, by the way. I, I, it's probably not something to joke about, but I think about, I don't think Moses kicked himself that hard for missing out and walking to the promised land because if he got to watch it from afar and the rest of them got to keep going in, they were pretty hard on Moses. They really were. They're hard on Aaron, too. Boy, we have died in the wilderness. <laughs> yeah, good one. Verse 3. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? It makes me think of what Brother Carl's song was about that I would think of ancient anxiety and worry. You know, anxiety comes from worrying about something that hasn't even happened. It comes from something you don't even know is going to happen. You're worried about something that has not manifested. It may never manifest, but you're, you're burning your guts in, in, in knots and holes over something that might not ever even happen. Or isn't even true. 
It's hearsay. It's whatever it is. And here they are. Oh, they will fall by the sword. Have they ever fallen by the sword when they obeyed God up to this point? Absolutely not. So why would that change? God's a God of promises, is he not? But here they've completely lost all their faith because these ten uh, spineless spies come in there and give an evil report, the Bible says, about what they had seen and start changing their story. Oh, my goodness. And now all the people, what do they want to do? They gravitate towards that. Nobody's over here worried about, well, Caleb just said, let's go take it. No one's referencing him. They probably just got louder and talked over him. Have you ever been in a situation like that? You, you don't mean to argue with somebody, but you kind of get an argument, and then... Even when, especially when the person's wrong, all they feel like, now I've got to get louder and talk over you because I'm wrong, but I want to make sure you hear my point. I feel like that's what they, they probably tried to drown out Caleb. They don't want to hear reason because they probably knew he was right. But it's easier to just complain. And you know how Paul, you know, Apostle Paul tells us so much about, you know, mortifying the deeds of the flesh and renewing our minds. Why? Because there's things that are really easy to do, and the easy things to do in life are never good for you. You know what's really easy? Sitting up late and eating junk food. That's simple. The, the hardest part is getting up and getting it out of the cupboard. And it's simple to do. What's hard to do is when you're used to that, cutting that off. But you know it's what you're supposed to do. You know it's better for you. Financially, you know it's easy to just blow money. That's not hard to do at all. But boy, the aftermath sure does sting, doesn't it? When if you just took some time and counted the cost and budgeted and did whatever, you know what? That takes time, effort, and it can be painful because you can't run from the statement that you get every month. It is what it is. However, you take the time to do what's right and you avoid some of these pitfalls, you feel better. It's hard. Your flesh doesn't want to do it because it's not easy, but you benefit from doing that. Hey, Christian, it's a lot easier to just sit there with your glasses on the brim of your nose, scroll on your phone all night. That's easy to do. It's easy to get in the easy chair and just go back and watch whatever program for hours on end. That's easy. You know what else it is? It's damaging to your soul. Because you're not growing with God, and chances are you're getting in things in most cases that are not good for you. And you say, well, I watch preaching and stuff. That's, that's good. Yeah, keep doing that. But every day, every time the TV is on? Or are there things that are taking you away from time in the Word, time in prayer, time in fellowship with the brethren? You understand what I'm saying? It's easy to do that stuff. And it's never good for you. It's easy to just jump on and be negative because, well, there's no pushback there. Everybody else is doing it, and that's what happens. And you miss the complete power of God by getting negative. Because if you're negative and you're, and you're complaining and you're whining, then you're missing the promises of God. So it goes on to say, uh, let me get, uh, let's see. Verse 4. And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephuel, uh, that's not it, Jephune, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. I don't blame them, by the way. Here's why. It says, and they spake unto all the company of Israel, or the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. Remember, they brought fruit back. They brought the grapes. They brought the pomegranates. They brought the figs. They told me there's an abundance of milk and honey, just as God said. Hey, there's the thing they should be fixed on. Hey, it's just what God said. Now we've seen it for ourselves. As if there could have been any doubt anyway. But it's right here. It's right for the plucking. And it says. In verse 8, uh, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their, de their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Yeah. Now you think, all right, that's a pretty good sermon from our boy Joshua here, right? That, that's pretty good. Like, all right, he got him back on track. He's right. God did promise us. He's going to take care of us. Uh, God has already removed their defenses. We're going to steamroll. So now the Israelites are probably, all right, we, we kind of lost our minds there for a second. Thanks for bringing us back, Joshua. Actually, read verse 10. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Here we go with the stoning. Hey, we don't like what you're saying. You're speaking truth. Let's kill them. That's what they're saying. And it says, And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Now you're in trouble. 
Because now God's going to judge you. I want to take a second to appreciate Joshua and Caleb. And the Joshua and Caleb's that are in churches today. Ones that... And by the way, ladies, you can be a Joshua and Caleb too. Just want to be clear about that. People who are on fire in the work. They're on fire in church. They want more. They can't get enough of the preaching. They can't get enough of the teaching. They can't get enough of the Bible time. They can't get enough of witnessing. They can't get enough of the singing and all that. It doesn't matter. Do you believe you have a talent to sing or not? We're called to make a joyful noise of the Lord. Man, open up and shout for the Lord because He is our Redeemer. He's our Savior and He deserves your praise. But think about there's only a couple like that, and the rest of the church is a bunch of spiritual duds. I mean, we're talking about Scrooges, we're talking about meanies, we're talking about any kind of, uh, what, curmudgeon's a good one. Oh my goodness. Folks, you know, a lot of times Baptists get that stereotype where we're a bunch of curmudgeons. We're a bunch of people who sit there with their arms couldn't be crossed tighter, they couldn't be frowning better, and, and I've seen the memes online, it's like Baptist, how Baptists worship on Sunday, and it's a person sitting there looking like this, with it saying amen above it. That's embarrassing. That's terrible, guys. You know, I think about when a kid gets out of school for the... <laughs> Oliver's the complete opposite of that right now. He's about to go back into school. And he's scratching, he's digging his claws into the floor as we pull him away. Uh, but it's different when you get out of school. I can remember when I was getting out. Last day of school. Woo! They're getting out the locker, throw all them stupid papers away. Don't need them anymore. They're just going to reteach it next year anyhow. Throw it away. We're free. We're out of school. We got, depending on your school district, we had like three months off. Summer vacation. Woo! -hoo! We're free! You know, I, I got excited. I don't know about you. I skipped. I was excited to get out. It was time to go play baseball without the hindrance of, it, of homework and things like that. I could go fishing with my grandparents. I could go and do whatever I want. Summer was a fun time. We're, we're free from school. And you get excited and you jump around. It's a good thing. You go to church and you tell Christians, hey, Jesus died on the cross for you. Aren't you glad that you're saved? You don't have to go to a devil's hell. You don't have to smell like smoke. You are free from whatever sins that you committed. The Lord took care of them all at the cross. Bless his holy name forever. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And he's going to prepare a place for you. And he loved you. He's put you in a good church. He's given you his word. He's given you brothers and sisters in the faith. So you can continue in this dark and sinful world. Aren't you glad? And people sit there and you hear crickets are louder than the people. The breathing through some people's noses are louder than the amens because there ain't any. Why? Guys, think about what we're talking about here. And these are all God's promises. And you say, man, you know what? Man has let me down. I've had some, some people that I've loved more than anything else in the world let me down accidentally, but it's still a letdown. And it hurts a little bit. You go through and make plans to have somebody over and you find out, hey, we can't come to dinner, X, Y, Z happened, or hey, we can't do this today because this happened. And you're like, God's not once done that for me. He's come through every time. Every time. I have no reason to doubt him. Now, time to get honest because you know what happens for me? I, I forget it like that sometimes. I forget how good God is to me sometimes. I let my circumstances avalanche upon me when I shouldn't, when I should let God sit there and hold up the, the mudslide that's coming my way of spiritual trash and nonsense and devil's lies and doubt. And I say, oh, Lord, what am I going to do? I, I'm laying on the floor. I'm moping around. Oh, woe is me. Why would I ever do that? Why do any of us ever do that? Why? Because the battle of life is real. Because our adversary is real. And because you know what ends up happening? You ever hear the phrase that misery loves company? A lot of times when you're down, what... People don't usually go for a good spiritual pick-me-up. They don't go to that brother or that sister that's on fire for the Lord. They go find someone else to go bellyache with. <clears throat> this isn't working. This isn't, yeah, I know what you mean, man. This, this is no good. And blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, come on, guys. You can't be happy doing that either. You can't tell me you're happy about it. I, I've used the example before. I'm like, hey, if you're married, then you've got a spouse, and uh, you get in that argument, but then you know what? So they say something funny. And you're trying your best not to even let the corners of that mouth go up. Because you don't want to give them an inch in this battle. You're going to stick it out to the bitter end. And you're not even going to give them. You're not going to be like, all right, you know, this is silly. You hold on and you're, you're sitting there. Have you ever really tried to suppress a smile when you're trying to be mad? It's, you, imagine what you look like. Get a mirror when you do it next time. That, that'll break it completely. You'll laugh at yourself. We're like that with God sometimes. All the promises God has given us here in the New Testament, in the age of grace. And we still act like he's not going to come through for us. Now, I understand there's times where there's storms. 
There's times that you go through uh, moments in life that you feel like it's never going to end. But it will. It will. And in the time you've got God with you, he said he'll never leave you or forsake you. You know how we're talking about a God of promises? A God who will never leave you or forsake you. Even when you act so disrespectful to your father, even when you are not the Christian you are supposed to be, he doesn't leave you or forsake you. Think about that for a second. Doesn't that drive you closer to him and realize how much he loves you, even when you feel so unlovable? And poor Joshua and Caleb. You're right there. He, they're part of that promise. They've seen it. It's like, it's exactly as God said. Man, let's go. I can't wait to see. How is he going to take these giants down? This is going to be awesome. Is he going to open the earth and swallow them up? Are we going to be able to throw spears and get them? Are they going to just fall over and, and turn the flames? I don't know. But God said they're, they're ours. We'll devour them. The land will devour Whatever it may be. And everyone else is... We're not doing this. This is ridiculous. Let's go back to Egypt. Could you imagine being Caleb and Joshua? You are ready to shout. You, you, victory is in hand. And everybody else is like, nah. Nah. See, if you read on, for sake of time, we're not going to. But you read on, God pronounces judgment. And that everyone in that generation that there was the exodus out is going to drop over dead. Except for Caleb and Joshua. Good for them. But now they've got to wait an extra 40 years when they're standing right at the door of the promised land. Can you imagine that one? One thing I really like about Caleb, though, he said, hey, you know what? When I get my inheritance, oh, I want my mountain. I want my mountain. He, did, he didn't get mad at God for this. He, neither did Joshua. He wanted, they wanted the promises of God. It, they were going to have it. Let me tell you, when a church gets negative, you hurt yourself, one, but there are people who would really want to see God do wonderful things in a church house or in a family, whatever it may be. And because the negative, the negative spirit that just spreads throughout a church so easily absolutely quenches it. And are we not told not to quench the Holy Spirit? Just to, It's like throwing a bucket of water on a good fire. See, when I lived at home, in the summer and into the fall, I... I burned as much wood as my dad would let. I just loved to sit out at the fire. We lived in the woods, in a home. And <laughs> I, I want to make sure we're clear on this. I wasn't raised by wolves, uh, but uh, we had a nice backyard. A lot of trees all around, but you can look straight up and see all the stars. We're, you know, we're in the, there's no light pollution, anything like that. It just burned on fire. And I'd sit you know, during summer vacation. I didn't have to get up for anything the next morning. I'd sit there at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning just sitting there looking at a fire. Didn't I sound like a guy you wanted to go hang out with back in the day? <laughs> Rip, roar, good time. Didn't even have to have hot dog and s'mores. But I enjoyed that. That was nice. Could have fire. When I moved up to Geneva, and I lived in a uh, in the neighborhood where my in-laws live, turns out you got to put it out with fire or with water. I'm sorry. I'm like, what? I was insulted to be told that. To be honest with you, you don't ruin a good fire with a bucket of water. Why? Because it puts it out. And you let that thing die on its own. That was how we did out in the country. We weren't worried about things being burned up. It's a little different when there's, you know, rules in place and other people are living there. It turns out. However, I think that so many times we can have a good fire kindled. We can be built and burning on the truth of God. And we can be on fire one minute and just throwing that more logs on the fire. We're good. But then someone comes along and gets negative, catches it, they're on it, puts it out with a big bucket of water. Someone comes along and quenches the spirit. I've been in church services where things were going good, and there's been people who've walked through the door. I kid you not, it feels like there was a suction and just pulled the Holy Spirit right on out of the place. It's the weirdest thing. But it's people who only wanted to bellyache, complain, and whine. And it hurts everybody else. Now, best of my knowledge, this isn't a problem in the church house here today, but it doesn't mean that tomorrow it couldn't start. This is, I believe, a warning message. It's the only thing I can think of why God would put it on my heart. But I'll tell you, faith and endurance matter. If you look at four, uh, chapter 14, and you're looking at verses 6 through 10, when you get Joshua's report, and you consider all the verses we've read today, where do you want to identify yourself as? Everyone else? Oh my goodness. Hey, parents, if you tell your kids today, hey, if everybody jumped off a bridge, would you go do it? It's a fair question. Well, one to you if the kid says yes. That's, figure something out there. 
I think there are kids that would up and do it. My goodness, they'd have their TikTok going and be like, oh man, you know, I think they call it cloud or something like that. I'm, I'm so not with it. I, I was when MySpace and Facebook first came out. This other stuff is beyond me. But you got people break dancing and stuff in the middle of a store and interrupting things. And like, how entitled can you be to think everybody should work around you so you can make a video? It's, it's, it's rude and ridiculous. But I'm becoming a baby boomer. I'm telling you, I'm not going to put up with this. So I'm not doing it. Not on my watch. But. Anyhow, let me encourage you to stay anchored and be like Joshua, be like Caleb. The world's going to be negative. They're going to find fault. They're looking. People naturally just want to poke holes in anything. If you've got a pretty good balloon going, they're looking to let the air right out of it. You to protect yourself. Be strong on God. I will ask you, brothers and sisters, has God ever let you down once? You say, well, I don't feel like my prayer got answered. But we pray in hopes of the God over all things, if he is willing. We'd love to see him heal everybody we've ever prayed for to have healed. That's not always his will. The most important thing is to make sure they know Jesus. Every one of us, one day, unless we go by way of the rapture alive, we're all going to die. Are you ready for that? It could be today. And of course, I would pray that it is not. But when it's your time, it's your time. Are you ready to meet your God? Because that's the reality of this. Don't let people keep you from life. Don't let them keep you from promise. Don't let them keep you from a loving God who has provided and done everything for you. The grapes of wine is obviously a play on word on the grapes of wrath. Because those who doubt God's way and those who rebel against God, it says in Revelation that he will trod them underfoot in his wine press. He will stomp them down. That's not the company I want to keep. I'm not interested in the popular crowd. I'm interested in the right crowd. As my kids grow, I'm interested in them having the right kind of friends. I'm not interested in letting them running with people who are going to rip their faith down and cause them to doubt the things of God. I want them to be around people who they can encourage and also be encouraged by. That's why I want for my friends. When we were on vacation, uh, I'm, I'm done, I'll just share this. When we were on vacation, we, uh, last Sunday, we saw our friends, they visited here a few times. They go to Shawnee Baptist in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, I got excited to get up and go to another church. Not because of you guys. But hey, what's it like to sit down for a service? And what's it like to you know, get, get fed and, and see how they sing? And stuff? And it was, they sing five hymns there. And they still get done in an hour. I still can't figure out how they did it. I think the, the clock was wrong or something. I was like, they sang five hymns. The preaching was good. I mean, you were talking about shouting amen preaching. And we were still out there in an hour. I was like, man, this is a dream come true. It was something else. I'm saying for fun, you look for, I'm excited to go to church. It's not like, all right, let's go and just be nice friends. Let's just go with them. It's like, man, let's go. Let's get up and get ready. Let's be in our place and let's get fed. This was great. See, pastor's a weirdo. Nah, man, I love the Lord. I'll tell you, I love the Lord. I love the preaching of God's word. I love singing for the Lord. I love being around and meeting new brother. It was funny. There was a fellow over there that you get excited in church when, when visitors come. So a guy came right over to me and my wife. Of course, we're not familiar faces. Hey, you guys visiting today? I was like, yeah, you bet, man. We're excited. Oh, who are you here with? We're here with the Peterman family. Oh, yeah, we love them and stuff. So are you thinking about moving down here or what's going on? I was like, no, no, we're just passing through. And the guy's like, oh, okay. Well, and shook our hands and walked away. He's like, got, got to go find someone else to encourage, right? You know, I get it. He was nice. Again, we got so many handshakes from people. And so it was, it was awesome, man. I'll tell you what. What do you do for fun, Pastor? I'll tell you what. If I happen to sit down and try and watch a movie, I want something that's faith-based. If, I, if I'm in my car, what am I listening to? I'm listening to a Bible podcast or I'm listening to preaching. Anybody want to hang out with me? I'm telling you, i got time. Let's hang out. Let's listen to some podcasts. Let's listen to some preaching. Let's talk about it. I, I like that. My, my tastes have changed because of what God's done in my life. And if you're honest today, you know that God's changed your taste too. I know how easy it is to turn negative. I know how easy it is to get woe is me. I don't like being negative. And I want to try and guard my... Some people, are they're more prone to it. It's easier for them. I, I want to make sure I'm putting safeguards in my life to keep from being in that place where I forget about the goodness of God. A good example of it is Psalm 77. Read that song if you think about it. See how the tone changes as it goes through the song. It's a little bit bleak. It's a little bit sad. A little bit... Mm, but then it turns when the psalmist starts remembering God. 
Don't forget the good God that we serve and what he's done for you. Let's stay on our feet. We'll bow our heads in a word of prayer.